Okay. Yeah. Welcome everybody to this session on uh, Senegal, the next hotspot for African agribusiness. Uh, my name is Hanke van Hoof. I'm private sector development coach at RVO, the Netherlands Enterprise and Development Agency. I welcome everybody to this uh, session in English. There's a translation, another session in French, if you'd like to follow this in another language. Um, I would like to start with introducing uh, some of the rules for this session. Uh, if, uh, Carrie, please, you could put up uh, your presentation, then we can show them on the screen. Okay, then we start with introducing the panel first. So I'm Hanneke. Um, then we have Nick Schelling, the uh, agricultural councillor for Senegal, working from Morocco normally, now he's in the Netherlands. But, uh, uh, he's uh, the agricultural councillor together with uh, Vivian. Uh, she uh, is the local uh, uh, agricultural attaché at the uh, Netherlands Embassy in Dakar. Um, he will speak later on uh, the background of, uh, of the project that we've been working on together with uh, SENS. Michiel Arnoldus and Gary Kidd, both directors of, the, uh, of this very excellent consultancy firm that has performed um, a value chain analysis in five different sectors in the agricultural sector in Senegal. And they've worked on seven different business cases and they will introduce all uh, after Nick has been presenting the background of, uh, of this project. And then there is uh, Lode de Bakker on this panel. We're really happy that he could join in last minute uh, to share his experience of doing business in Senegal. He's actually Belgian, uh, working for the Dutch company Silas Export, with a lot of experience exporting onions, potatoes and carrots to West Africa. And since uh, two years, we started Agro Expedition, the local company in Senegal that uh, is working on storage for potatoes, onions and carrots. And they're also starting a production line for transformation of potatoes into French fries. And he will share his experiences of doing business in Senegal later on. Uh, next slide, please. So just a really short... Uh, uh, <coughs> Then. Uh, as you may know, we cannot hear or see you. Uh, if you have audio problems, try phone call. Um, it will be toll free or local tariff. Please ask questions using the question tab. We cannot uh, hear you. So you can type any questions that you may have in the chat box and we'll try to answer them after the presentation. And there can be a discussion with all of the panel members. Um, so we'll try to answer the most important questions that you have. And in the meantime, there also will be pop up some polls. We would like to hear from you uh, who are, why you are participating in this session and some other questions. And then um, the results will show up so we can also see who else is in the audience. Well, I wish you a very good session. And uh, oh yeah, I will. <laughs> so first we start with a background. Uh, uh, Nick will explain uh, why we started this uh, project on uh, analyzing different value chains in Senegal uh, and what the next steps uh, will be after this session. Um, then Carrie and Michiel will give insights in uh, everything that they've learned during the research. And then we'll uh, close with a discussion. I'd like to give the floor to Nick. Thank you very much, uh, Hanneke. And welcome oh, also to. Uh, sorry, I see that there is already one poll that we like to start with. Um, and ABC is is uh, uploading uh, the question. Okay, I wait. Yeah. Or do you have the question on the screen, Kerry? No. Then NABC should uh, present the poll in the chat box. Well, uh, maybe then we'll just continue um, with Nick's yeah. 
yeah. presentation. And if the poll pops up, then we can uh, uh, then we can uh, treat that first. Okay, thanks again, and welcome everybody to this uh, web about uh, opportunities in Senegal, every business opportunities. My name is um, Nick Schelling. I am the agricultural councillor for Senegal and Morocco. I live in uh, in Morocco at and work at the uh, embassy, the Dutch embassy in Rabat. Uh, last year, uh, our Ministry of Agriculture decided to to start also an agro team in Senegal, and uh, this team is now fully integrated in the. Dutch Embassy uh, in Dakar. Um, yeah, it's uh, our Senegal team started in February 2020, and it consists of uh, of three people. And uh, the at the, the earlier slide you saw also our um, our email address. There below email, duck dash lmv and then at minbusa.nl. So keep that well in mind. Thank you very much. Um, so we are three people, and here you see the two key players in the agro team that is uh, in the background. You see uh, Vivian Faye. She is the local uh, technical assistant. And um, in front of her, you see Yassin Arashti. He is our junior assistant uh, in Rabat, but also working for for senegal so he's working with me uh, in rabat um, so together with me we are a, a team of three people and of course um, we work as an integrated part of the of the embassy so the whole embassy is important of course the uh, the ambassador and all the other colleagues that uh, are uh, helping us with our uh, our work very important um, why are we uh, interested uh, in Senegal, in agribusiness in Senegal? Well, we see a lot of opportunities uh, for the need for food, of course, in the first place. And, of course, technology, and that's one of our strong points, agricultural technology. Also very important is that uh, agricultural development will be sustainable. Of course... In Senegal and many other countries, uh, especially in West Africa, there are challenges like food security, population growth, um, the effects of climate change, and of course, uh, water scarcity is a big issue, and of course, migration and uh, also the instability in the Sahel region. But there are also a lot of uh, advantages. Uh, stable country. Uh, there are good physical conditions for agriculture. It's relatively close to the European Union, so export opportunities, there are plenty. Um, there is ambition, and of course, very important also are the, the trade routes that go from Senegal into the Sahel countries and to other countries in West Africa. Next, please. Um, let us take a look at some of the trading figures of the Netherlands and Senegal. Then we see that the Netherlands imports a lot of uh, mango and, and beans, and this is uh, growing very, very fast, so it's important to support that. And Senegal imports a lot of uh, onions from the Netherlands. In fact, it is the biggest market for Dutch onions in the world, and also potatoes and seed potatoes, mainly seed potatoes. And also uh, uh, below you see the export to the Sahel countries. That is more than a billion. So also the, the trade from Senegal to, for example, to Mali, to other countries in the Sahel region is a very important uh, role of uh, Senegal as a, as a trade nation. The next, please. Here you see uh, Dutch onions uh, in, the, in Dakar. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's the most important export product that we that we have to Senegal, and um, it is uh, very much appreciated by the, by the Senegalese uh, producer. The next, please. Now we go to uh, to the scoping study, which is the central uh, theme of this uh, of this webinar. Um, 
to make a good start in Senegal with agriculture, we decided to start with a scoping study to get a good idea about um, the situation in Senegal and the development opportunities and the opportunities for, for cooperation, business cooperation. So we made an analysis, uh, or we asked, in fact, uh, the consultant uh, Time for Sense to make an analysis of the most important value chains and uh, uh, to uh, see where Dutch technology can have an added value in the further development. Also to identify concrete cooperation opportunities and to make this visible in the, in the formulation of some um, uh, business opportunities and the uh, identification of business partners on both sides, both in Senegal and the Netherlands. Next, please. Um, yeah, of course, we are talking about agriculture, but um, more and more important to see that also storage and packaging and marketing are very important and essential issues in the development of, uh, of Senegalese uh, agribusiness. So this also needs a lot of attention. Next, please. So we have uh, asked the consultant to focus on a number of, uh, of, uh, of sectors or value chains. And one, of course, uh, you can't miss that, is, of course, mango. Um, how can we uh, work together on improving the quality of the production and on the export of mango? to, for example, to the Netherlands. The Netherlands is one of the big importers of mangoes from Senegal. Uh, onions, of course, I already talked about the export from the Netherlands, but we are also looking at local production of onions, um, production of onions, but also storage and uh, packaging and marketing uh, is a, an important issue there. Then potatoes, also very important for food supply and quality. Um, then a variety of vegetables, uh, beans production is already uh, very important, but we are also looking at uh, other vegetables um, and sometimes also in combination with, uh, with potatoes. Then the fifth is uh, poultry. Um, most of the animal proteins in Senegal come from fish, but you see that also poultry is, uh, is a sector that is uh, highly appreciated by the by the Senegalese uh, consumer so also there we look at uh, the possibilities so that will there you will get more information from um from the from the consultants and um also from uh, mr de bakker what is his experience in that field then we can go to uh, what can the embassy do for you for you as a company or an institute well, as you can see, we are doing this kind of studies to get a good impression of the opportunities in, in Senegal and the added value that Dutch technology can bring. Then we can help with uh, business and, uh, and context in, in government institutions, for example, in, in the field of uh, export certification or in the field of, um, of extension. Then... Uh, third point is that we uh, organize webinars uh, or seminars in the normal times. And of course, we also participate in trade fairs. We organize trade missions, uh, sometimes with, uh, with ministers or with uh, high-ranking officials from the Netherlands. We also organize um, uh, trips of uh, Senegalese experts to the Netherlands in the framework of a cooperation agreement. Then... The fourth point that I wanted to mention, and it's a very important point, certainly for, for, the, for the business people uh, in our audience, that are the, the RVO instruments, the instruments, financial instruments to support uh, companies to start their business in, uh, for example, in a country like Senegal. Um, yes, that is what I would like to, uh, to tell you as, an, uh, as a start of this, um, I think, very interesting hour of uh, agribusiness development in uh, in Senegal. Thank you very much, and have a nice rest of the hour. Thank you, Hanneke, to you. Yes, thank you for that brief introduction and background. 
Um, you can uh, find all the value chain reports and business cases on the website of RBO. I'm sharing the link in the chat box. And then I'll give the floor to Carrie and Mikhail to give us insights in the most important elements of these uh, reports and the findings. Over to Carrie and Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. We're so uh, we're so excited to share with you some of these insights from what is a very large study. Um, but before we go into that, I think it would be really interesting for us to know, uh, you know, what um, we've looked at some of the value chains uh, that we uh, Nick's mentioned some of them: onions, potatoes, mangoes, vegetables, poultry. Uh, in the chat function, if you could just let us know quickly. Which of these uh, do you think are particularly exciting for you, are very relevant to you? Um, just so we can get a sense of what's most important to cover today. So if you can just look to your right, you should have a chat function. Uh, if you could do a quick um, type in, uh, and then we'll be able to follow that. See. All right, anyone there? Good, Hanika, perhaps you can keep track of uh, keep track of it, and then we can uh, have a check in later. Yes, on. I'll do that. Uh, you can see the chat box as well, Carrie and Mikhail. Yes. Okay. yes. As soon as we share the presentation, we won't be able to. Um, let's get back to the presentation then, because we do have a fair deal to, to cover. Um, Nick has mentioned earlier that we covered a number of uh, value chains. Uh, let's get those up. Okay. And so today, you know, it's just not possible for us to give you a deep dive into all of these value chains. Um, today, it should really be considered to be a bit of a quick start. Uh, we'll give you a couple of highlights. We'll perhaps whet your appetite for more. Um, but if you want to learn more, we really suggest that you go to the Arvio um, Senegal page, which is www.arvio.nl forward slash Senegal, to download uh, individual, country, individual value chain reports. Um, those should be available in, in the coming days. Uh, and thereafter, for you to join us in a session we're going to be having in uh, 2021, in the first quarter, we're hoping. Um, if you are interested in joining us for that deep dive session, where we'll cover each of these value chains independently, as well as looking at, uh, I imagine, more opportunities, getting more panelists to share their perspectives, then please share your email with Hanika. Her email address is Hanika dot van ho at rvo.nl i'm sure she's sharing that in the uh, in the chat function as i speak and that promises to be uh, i think a, a, we provide lots more depth uh, and lots more practical insight so now let's get on to the value chain um, insights themselves and we mentioned that we covered uh, five different value chains um, and from these, we thought, let's just spend a little bit of time thinking about the real competitive advantage that Senegal itself has um, that became apparent and are very relevant to these value chains. There are about four specific areas of competitive advantage that were revealed. Nick has already mentioned that Senegal is very close to the EU. Uh, in fact, I was quite surprised to discover that it's probably an additional day or two using road transport if you wanted to um, if you wanted to uh, move product from Senegal to the Netherlands, for example. Um, and those deliveries are able to arrive uh, near daily, uh, which is definitely a, a distinct advantage. From the perspective of climate, uh, the very dry climate in Senegal uh, provides real opportunities for low pest pressure. Uh, and I think that you know, for most people who are in the vegetable trade particularly, that's the reason to smile. Uh, in terms of production calendar, we definitely saw that there were some advantages both for vegetables and for mango, uh, in addition to being um, one for potatoes. So if we think about the European winter months, the, the fact that Senegal is a little bit further south, closer to the equator, means that they have a warmer climate generally and are able to supply products to the European Union during those winter months. Um, a further advantage you'll be able to see later on in mango in that they have a very um, special uh, supply window. Uh, and then finally, a cooler climate along the coast, meaning that they're able to supply potatoes during the, uh, the cool winter months uh, in Senegal. 
Another key advantage which was uh, revealed and I thought was quite interesting was scale. Uh, you know, in some African countries, when you do value chain research, uh, you find that uh, industry tends to be nearly absent. There are lots of small scale dominated agriculture. Uh, in Senegal, you could see that there's been some development towards industrialization. So whether you're talking about potatoes or poultries, uh, even onions to a certain extent, uh, vegetables, even mango production, you find larger, more developed producers uh, in the case of mango with very strong re uh, relationships with European importers. So lots of pockets of competitive advantage developing. Uh, in fact, I'm sure that I've not listed them all here. Uh, and in time, uh, you know, we'll, we'll um, be able to talk about those. I thought that uh, seeing as this is probably the most interesting opportunity and the one that's most visible, that we start with a little bit of a whistle-stop tour of mango. Right, we know that the Netherlands is a major importer of mango from Senegal, um, but I really want us to all see why that is the case. Why is Senegal such an important mango supplier to the European Union? Uh, on your screens will be a chart showing you the various months of the year and the major suppliers to the EU in those specific months. If you move along to June, July, uh, and look at that bit of the chart that is in, in orange, you can see that Senegal tends to export mangoes to the European Union at a time in the year when very many of the other producers are producing relatively little, um, which is an amazing advantage. So it definitely means that there are opportunities to increase the exports to the European Union uh, during those warm European summer months. Um, right. However, having that very interesting export window is not a reason to rest on your laurels. We know that the Mexicans are working very hard, for example, to extend the time period in which they're producing. And so it's really important that Senegal becomes better at becoming uh, more efficient. Um, and we know that there are real opportunities to improve the overall productivity of Senegalese orchards. If you have a look at the average yield per hectare in Senegal compared to the regional benchmark South Africa, which is in the dark blue on the right, you can see that there's a lot of headroom. Uh, you know, even some of Senegal's most sophisticated producers sit below the South African uh, benchmark for something like Kent or for Keat. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to increase yields per hectare, per hectare and we'll, we'll talk about some real opportunities for how that can be done. Um, the, you know, the very first, and uh, I want to bring your attention to the centre panel, is about orchard renewal and expansion. You know, at the most simplest level, very often the trees are um, you know grafted onto local rootstock um, but because there isn't a very regulated system of producing uh, these grafted trees uh, it means that some producers are just not aware of what they actually have they're not really uh, clear on the yield potential of a specific tree and so there's a real opportunity to renew the existing orchards with uh, very um, certified uh, clonal varieties of, of mango, uh, particularly if we can source some mango uh, that is uh, high yielding and guaranteed to be high yielding. We've seen some interest from industrial producers already uh, who are starting to uh, build their own orchards. Some of these are the vegetable producers, um, but there's definitely an opportunity for this orchard renewal and expansion in new zones outside of the Niai and along the Senegal River Valley. Now, um, we know that a lot of these mangoes are destined for the export market. And so it is just smart business, honestly, to focus on uh, phytosanitary pressure, really making sure that the entire sector is focused on uh, reducing pest pressure, really keeping tight control of tree health, um, you know, carrying out orchard maintenance on a regular basis to make sure that those exports are protected. And of course, managing phytosanitary pest pressure also has the added benefit of making sure that you can achieve your maximum yield. So those are definitely some opportunities that need um, to be explored further. Now, if you speak to anybody in Senegal and you talk about mango, I think almost anyone mentions the uh, unutilized potential in the cover months. Uh, in reality, this is probably the biggest mango producing region in Senegal. 
yet a lot of that mango is produced in uh you know really household production so it's a, a mango tree which is in somebody's backyard there are some developing orchards but they're still at a small scale uh, and this really means that there's a, a large availability of mango in that region um However, uh, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done in figuring out what those varieties are. There's a, a fair volume of Kent and Keats available, um, but there is a lot of other varieties, local varieties. And I think one of the key questions coming out of this study is what to do with those. Are they suitable for, uh, for uh, juice pulp? Are they suitable for dried mango? What exactly can be done? Whatever the decision, whether the opportunity is in processing, which we strongly feel the opportunity is more in processing than it is in the fresh market at the moment, there's a lot to be done around logistics, particularly around a structured, rigorous collection system, a smooth collection system that ensures that this fruit is collected from these small-scale producers. Um, and we believe that this could be a very powerful lever for growth in the Kazamans. Now, um, throughout the study, we were keeping an eye out for real commercial opportunities uh, and linking some of those opportunities to the levers for development. Um, in this particular study, we identified four opportunities. Three, we think, are, are really clear opportunities. Those are the ones that you see in that teal color. Uh, orchard maintenance services is one of them, uh, which is really a pruning and spraying service to control pest pressure and improve yields. Another is a nursery and new orchard planning service. So really focusing on producing these uh, high quality mango uh, seedlings that are marketed to both industrial and smaller scale producers. Um, another opportunity we saw was in a modern high yielding orchard. So really uh, focusing on planning out a high yielding orchard making sure that the spacing of the trees is, is sensible, that they are uh, it's with quite an intensive planning, that you're using certified cyan, um, precision farming methods, precision irrigation, precision pesticide uh, measures. And for each of these opportunities, you can see by that little symbol in the right, we have some um, business cases that have been developed specifically targeting those opportunities. You're able to download these from the Aria website. Uh, and in the uh, deep dive session, we'll be exploring those a little further. The final opportunity we identified was this processing opportunity in the Kazamans, whether that is juice and or dried fruit. Um, however, we do believe that there's a little bit more work that needs to be done, uh, some sort of a pre-study and a feasibility study to make sure that we really understand what each of those varieties can be used for um, before we advise uh, business models. Right, so that's our a little whistle-stop tour of mango. And that gets us on to the second opportunity, which we're quite excited about. I just want to remind you that if you should have any questions, uh, it's really an opportunity for you to type these in the chat box. Hanika is rounding them up, and we'll tackle them towards the end of the session in the panel discussion. So counter-cyclical vegetables. What do we mean by counter-cyclical vegetables, uh, I think, is the first question. Now, countercyclical vegetables for us take up, uh, advantage of that uh, opportunity in the Senegalese winter months, uh, October through to January or February when the temperatures are cooler in the Niai, uh, and in some stretches of the Senegal River Valley, enabling the production of green beans, sweet corn, uh, salad vegetables such as radish, um, salad onions, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and in, as a consequence of that, they allow summer vegetables, European summer vegetables, to be delivered during the European winter months, right? So that's a, a really exciting opportunity. This trade in European summer vegetables in the winter months is um, by and large dominated by four countries, uh, Morocco, Egypt, Kenya, and Senegal. Uh, on your screens now should be the exports per month from these key African countries over 2019. And you can see that throughout January through to April, um, there's increasing production um, of these summer vegetables, uh, increasing exports of these. Um, but throughout January through to April, um, there is a gap between what is actually exported and the 
uh, peaks that are reached in April. You see that again in October through to December. This really suggests that there is an opportunity to expand production and expand supply to the European Union, um, making sure that you know a greater footprint is, is being reached. We know that uh, Spain, Italy, France, the Netherlands, uh, Germany are all importing these vegetables um, and it would appear that there is some scope for growth. Now, it's important that we mention that you know, traditionally, when you talk about production in, in many of these African countries, you talk about small scale production. In the case of vegetables, small scale production is a little tricky, um, largely because of phytosanitary concerns and very rigid benchmarks being set and expectations being set by uh, retailers around the uh, quality of those vegetables and the pesticide residues. As a consequence, when you look at the types of models that have been expanding across Africa, uh, and definitely in Senegal, um, the model of production in vegetables tends to be vertically integrated. So large European countries investing in Senegal um, and really managing production tightly, uh, pretty much all aspects of production. Um, in the case of Senegal, this type of model comes generally at the expense of Egypt, which has been losing share in terms of imports and Kenya. Uh, in the case of Kenya, also a lot of those losses have come about because of um, this outgrower model, which hasn't been very tightly managed, and so they've had some issues around pest, uh, pesticide residues. Um, so there's definitely this opportunity. It'll require some investment promotion, uh, and I think a little bit more exploration with investors who, uh, uh, let's face it, at the moment have been affected by covid 19. I think most people are, are holding on to their cash and are very carefully scrutinizing potential investments. Does it mean that there's no scope for outgrower models? Not necessarily. So outgrower models are definitely tricky. Uh, we know that one error uh, with pesticide residues could result in an entire country ban. And so it's not surprising then that um, importers on the European side are quite hesitant of working with outgrower outgrowers. There are some outgrowers in um, outgrower schemes and importers, so exporters exporting vegetables to the European Union, but these are, are smaller volumes and they are declining in Senegal. Uh, and we're also seeing that there's a lot of internal pressure from industrial producers to m shift away from these outgrower models. And so there is a question, you know, are these outgrower models perhaps in the initial stages better suited for um, local production while the sector gets tight control over how you manage these pesticide residues. Um, so that's definitely something that should be, um, should be explored. Now, um, we've definitely seen in the Senegalese sector that as you've seen this expansion of industrial production, that there is some need to tackle sustainability issues and potentially some areas around competitiveness in the long run. Um, very specifically, you know, Senegal is a dry, hot and dry. Um, and so there are some questions around soil health. Uh, you know, lots of water, lots of irrigation. Um, there's some tendencies over the summer months to leave the lands fallow, which is resulting in, uh, in some increased salinization in the, in, the, in the area. And so there's more that needs to be done to make sure that that is controlled more tightly uh, and perhaps that there is more of an exploration around um, saline tolerant seed, uh, more precise agricultural techniques to make sure that there's a lower impact on, uh, on soil health. There's also a need for an increase, increased control and perhaps um, more judicious use of pesticides, uh, more green manuring practices. Uh, and throughout the study, we definitely identified a need for uh, perhaps more rotation. So in general, more sustainable agricultural practices as this production expands. We've already mentioned uh, water usage. So a lot of this production is clustered uh, in the Nyai and along the Senegal River Valley. Um, it definitely means that there is competing, there are competing needs for water in the area. Uh, and so there's definitely uh, a greater need for judicious use of that water. So making sure that all of the industrial producers are really using the most minimal uh, volumes of water, um, that they use techniques that minimize evaporation, 
um, that they use seed that minimizes water use uh, and so um, reduces overall um, salination. Uh, something that we think is really important is that this expansion along the Senegal River Valley gets explored to a greater extent. Um, the most logical locations for very many of these vegetable producers has been close to the airport near Dakar, placing them in, in that Centre Niai region. Um, however, the Senegal River Valley has access to irrigation, uh, and so more needs to be done to identify suitable agricultural land along that river valley, and then also to, you know, very cleverly manage the water resources. So, in general, we believe there's a, a lot to be done around this area of sustainable water and land man management. We really see that there's a lot of opportunity in this uh, vegetable system. Uh, we believe that the opportunity is not uh, a single variety or single uh, crop system, but rather a rotation crop system. And so we've developed a business model, a business case around a, a mix of vegetables. So onions, potatoes, vegetables, and very importantly, silage, uh, silage uh, fodder, which enables a little bit of green manuring, but also extends production throughout those hot summer months. Um, and we think it's quite important for protecting the overall health of the soil. These would be a, for a combination of markets. Local markets would require some of these vegetables, for example, um, onions. Uh, those onions can be exported to regional markets along with potatoes. Uh, but there are also opportunities for local market vegetables, such as uh, cabbages, um, perhaps even uh, some opportunities for uh, local vegetables like, uh, you know, okra, for example, leafy vegetables, uh, and so on. Uh, in terms of that silage or fodder, uh, we've identified that the opportunity is probably in sorghum and that there is a fair deal of demand for, uh, for this uh, fodder uh, for animal feed. Okay, if you're interested in this business model, we really recommend that you download it from the Aravio we website um, as soon as it becomes available. So we're going to take a little bit of a side step uh, away from vegetables and into animal protein. Um, let's have a look at poultry and eggs. Mm -hmm. uh, poultry and egg production in Senegal has grown very rapidly over the last four or five years. Uh, you can see that production of uh, broilers on your left um, has moved from something like 40 million birds to 50 million birds between 2016 and 2020. Right, egg production has also ramped up. However, as this production, has, so, and, and one of the key reasons for that growth in production is um, definitely market development. In fact, production development. There are more industrial producers. We see that there are quality inputs now available. Uh, local day-old chick production is happening. And um, as a consequence, there's a fairly efficient production system, particularly at the industrial level. Some of the feed conversion growth um, really approximate some of the European feed conversion rates, so really excellent. However, on the other end of the equation, you know, we know that supply is improving and becoming more sophisticated. We've got some issues around consumption. We've not seen as rapid a development in consumption of chicken. Uh, it, has, it has grown in, in consumption, but fish is still the dominant protein being consumed in the country. Chicken is about a once a week purchase, and by and large, that chicken is live chickens being sold on the market. Um, one of the key barriers to additional consumption is affordability, and so that, we believe, is one of the important levers that will need to be uh, pressed if we want to make sure that consumption increases. Um, this imbalance means that, you know, that in, essence, in essence, um, there might be some signs of oversupply at the moment. Right. Uh, one of the key questions is how exactly can these large, particularly large industrial producers open up new more market channels, such as the hotel, restaurant and catering chain? How can they move from a fresh chicken uh, distribution model to frozen chicken? Um, so that's on the industrial level. On the, the, commer on the small scale commercial um, level, we are seeing how this bottleneck in the marketing of chicken is causing some issues. So. Um, these small-scale producers, who might be producing something like 2,000 chicks per, per rotation, uh, often at the end of their production cycle, as they reach the end of their 45-day production cycle, 
um, they just don't have adequate market. You know, a trader would tend to use these small scalers as a top-up buy rather than as, as the core of their, of their um, supply. Uh, and, and as a consequence of that, these small-scale producers might be left with their live hens or uh, live chickens for far longer than the 45-day cycle. Uh, if you know anything about chicken production, uh, keeping to that 45-day cycle is absolutely critical. Uh, for every day thereafter, you're feeding your chicken, but it's not necessarily putting on weight. Uh, and so your feed conversion rate is declining, meaning that you have, in general, um, declining competitiveness um, and increasing costs with no real increases in revenue. So this is going to be a critical area, is how can we develop that market? How can we improve overall competitiveness? Um, this is also true of, of eggs. You know, um, The absence of a processing sector particularly means that there's no um, uh, uptake of these eggs causing some general, um, general issues um, in that sector. Again, we've produced a model. In the case of poultry and eggs, we've produced a hatching egg production model, and I really recommend that you have a look at that um, if, if it is of interest to you. Uh, potatoes are another very exciting opportunity in this market. Um, it's a new developing market. We know all across Africa and in Senegal that there's decrease, increasing uh, demand for, for potatoes. Um, but one of the real bottlenecks here is quality potato seed production. Um, some unsustainable protect, pr practices, particularly at the top end of the sector around those industrial producers. And so, you know, the real opportunity here is how can we expand production, but how can we do that sustainably? Um, onions, I'm not going to get into in any great detail because it will be covered in the onion um, roundtable, which is coming up uh, in a few minutes. Um, so we're just going to uh, speed on through that. Uh, however, when you do have a look at the uh, business cases, again, you'll see two business cases that are relevant for this. An onion outgrower scheme for quality onion and a mechanization services model will be available. Okay, there are a number of cross-cutting interventions that we see in Senegal. They're nothing to be particularly surprised about. They're everything from access to finance, uh, to seed system design and regulation. Um, it's just skills gaps, R&D, affordable energy solutions. Um, and again, these will be explored further in our deep dive. Great. Uh, we've really covered a great deal of information uh, in the last couple of minutes. Uh, and I think that uh, the most uh, powerful use of our time now would be for us to move to the panel discussion. I'm quickly going to move out of this um, screen share, which should enable you to again see all of the panelists. Um, and Hanukkah, I believe it's over to you. Yes, thank you, Kerry, for a very dense explanation of a lot of information and insights. I'm happy that we can have uh, more in-depth sessions in a couple of months' time, probably in the week of the 15th of March. So as I already put in the chat box, if you're interested to be uh, updated about that uh, event in March, please send me an email. My email address is in the chat box. And please just ask your questions now the floor is open and in the meantime when you formulate your questions i would like to hear from Lode de bakker who is also on our panel about his experience of doing business in senegal and uh, maybe some of the most important lessons you've learned and please put your microphone on so then we can hear you yes yeah, sorry my mic was off uh, good morning. I said I'm I'm Lode. I'm I'm Belgian, working for Agro Expedition Senegal, uh, where the the mother company is a, a Dutch company, Silas Export, where we are moving onto storage, especially for uh, potatoes, uh, uh, where we have already storage uh, capacity of 1,200 tons, and we are expanding to 3,200 tons, and also going into. Uh, Transforming French fries, uh, potatoes into French fries. If you ask me, the lessons that I learned in Senegal is especially don't do a copy paste of what is working in Europe, because this is not working in Africa, especially not in Senegal. Very important to know the culture, uh, and very important to know that that you have two sectors: you have informal and formal sectors. So. Both sectors uh, need a different approach. This is very important. Um, 
especially in agriculture, as uh, Kerry told before, you, you have these big companies uh, well organized, uh, indust almost industrial size. This needs another approach than if you are working with uh, the small farmers, where uh, already people don't speak French. Uh, they are in, a, in another state of mind, let me, let me tell it like that, uh, more in a survival uh, state. So doing business with do those two kinds of, uh, of sectors is completely different. But I agree there are still a lot, a lot of opportunities uh, in Senegal. When we uh, decided with Sila, Sila's export to invest in Senegal, so especially you have to know that in Senegal we, we reached autosuffisance. We are autosufficient in uh, uh, potatoes to feed the population. But unfortunately, most of the, the capacity, most of the, the, the crops are coming out at the same time. So there you have the law of economics. Uh, you, the offer is going high, but the demand stays the same, and there are not a lot of opportunity, a lot of possibilities to store potatoes. So there are no official numbers, but everything that I read is between twenty and forty percent of potato that is grown in Senegal is thrown away. This is crazy. We living in a world where people are hungry. And we are throwing potatoes in Senegal. So we have to go to a more sustainable agriculture and not just grow potato or grow onion. No. To who will we sell them? Uh, and Or how can we store them? And I think to that problem, there are three solutions, whether storage, export, or transformation. Now with Agro Expedition Senegal, we are working on, on two of those uh, things. It's storage what we already have, and now uh, the investment we will do with uh, transformation from potatoes to fresh French fries. That in some words, don't want to be too long. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for your explanation. I was um, wondering if anyone in the audience had a question. Uh, so far, we only had two remarks. I don't know, uh, Gary and Mikhail, if you have read them in the chat box. One was about um, uh, exporting sweet potatoes from the Casamance to the European Union, uh, which is very complicated, apparently. And uh, what they miss is some more attention to the possibilities and challenges in the Casamance. Uh, you already said something about this regarding mangoes. Would you have to say something about it for other sectors as well? Yeah, so the Casa Mans, it's a bit of a difficult one also because of the whole COVID-19 pandemic, we were obviously not able to travel to Senegal, uh, which also limited, quite frankly, our ability to assess what's happening in Casa um, um, So that's definitely still, I think, an area to, um, to work on. I think your comment around the logistics is uh, is an important one. I mean, there's a theoretical time and there's a real time that things take. Um, and um, yeah, I think also the Dutch embassy, I think, has, has invested in the past already in uh, developing the port and finding out what can be done to, to develop the port. And yeah, logistics is a key issue for Casamans uh, if you want to even, uh, you know, link to the lucrative market in, uh, in Dakar. And I think the, the, the bridge, uh, you know, was hailed as a big improvement. But yeah, if then you close it because of COVID-19, then you're still very isolated. So th that remains an issue, uh, um, yeah, the thousand months. So I think it's, it's something to dive deeper into. And I think, Marco, you're very right in saying that it's not two days to arrive in Europe. I think that the difference between sea freight and road freight from the Nyai uh, is a difference of two days. Um, yeah. In fact, I think it's about seven days from uh, from the Nyai to Rotterdam. Uh, and then, of course, from the Casamance, you've got the additional complexity of getting from the Casamance to um, to Dakar, um, which is indeed, a, is indeed a difficulty. Um, I'm trying to see where the other comments was. Uh... Were there any other questions that... Um... 
No, I don't think there were questions so far. There's just another remark um, from uh, Theo van der Veen, who is working for OFACRI. And he's saying that they're targeting commercial large scale agricultural opportunities based on a hybrid model with small scale exporters. They're open to the So thanks for that remark. It will certainly be, I will invite you all to have further discussions in, uh, towards our sessions in March. Yeah, so there are some hybrid models that that, that are there. Uh, I think particularly around mango and I think also around le um, melons uh, and onions as well. Huh? Well, onions, we, we look at an outgrower model, which yeah. is a combination of industrial production and small scale sourcing. Um, so that was definitely developed for onions. Yeah, I think that the, the, the advantage is that you need almost like a core plantation um, to have scale, to reach scale and to have certainty in your supply. Um, you know, I think across Africa, the days of setting up a factory that's entirely supplied by small scalers or an exporter is, is, is over because it's just too risky a proposition. Um, so a lot of attention is going to these kind of blended models where you have a core plantation, but it also requires investment. So you don't always have the investment capital to set up, you know, a plantation that supplies all of your export pack house or all of your factory. So then, you know, by pulling in small scales, you can still reach scale without having all of that investment capital uh, tied up. Um, but it does require you to also think about, you know, how do you select the small scales? What training do you give them? Um, how do you help them with finance? How do you do your quality control? Uh, so it's also a model that comes with the challenges, but yeah, you have a bit of a blend in, in terms of risks and investment capital needed. And it definitely can, can be done. Um, and I think, yeah, also from a development perspective, of course, it's an interesting model because then you don't end up with what you call islands of success where you've got this world-class uh, modern farm with a pack house, uh, but no real links with anything or any neighbors or anything in, in the country. Um, yeah, so it, the hybrid model has, of course, the advantage from a development perspective that you're disseminating more knowledge, uh, you're giving others opportunities to, to share in a success, you're sharing your knowledge and you maybe build more of an industry rather than just an individual player. I have a question for Loda. Uh, uh, so Loda, I'm quite interested in financing in, in Senegal. Um, and, you know, perhaps you could help us understand a little bit about that financing possibilities in Senegal. What are some of the challenges that you might have faced as you were setting up your agro About finance, we, we started Agro Senegal with uh, own capital uh, now almost three years ago. Uh, but it's true, we want to, to develop and uh, we want to grow. And then we, we found an opportunity with uh, RVO and Dutch Grow Fund, where uh, they, they allowed us a uh, finance to, to really take scale. And it's uh, thanks to them that we now can, we can uh, expand our capacity in storage, but also that we can start our transform, transformation uh, unit. Uh, if we would not have had uh, the support from Dutch Growth Fund, it were definitely project that we were planning on doing, but it would have been done much later. Uh, so thanks to that, we, we can expand more quickly uh, and we, go, we can go to extra storage and uh, transformation. But the, the, this was really a, a big help for us. Uh, if you have to start and look for finance here in Senegal, I think it's rather expensive. Possibilities are there. I don't have real experience with it, but it's 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 rather expensive. Yeah, it will be more expensive than in Europe. Uh, the advantage of Senegal, of course, is because they are packed to the euro. It's it's not mm -hmm. like Ghana, where you've got 25, 30, 35 percent interest. Uh, it's usually more around, yeah, yeah between no. 8 and 12 percent, depending on how well known you are as a company. And um, that, that's from what I, yeah, uh, what I know. Um, yeah. So another question I have, which is about market access. Um, I think it's quite interesting that you're in this, um, that you're in storage, but that you're moving into the transformation into these uh, French fries. Uh, but market access is typically a, a difficult challenge. We've seen that the poultry producers have found it difficult to access hotel, restaurant, and catering chains. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on 
on being able to sell, particularly that processed well, product. Honestly, I don't see a lot of uh, difficulties with that. Uh, you you have to be uh, what is very important into a, a good price range. You must have a, a good product, and then I'm sure that you can able that you can convince you can convince uh, clients. I don't see any problem on accessing the market since we already known here. We we, we have have agro expedition. I, I have a, we have a big network. Uh, I think accessing the market with storage it's much more difficult than uh, selling this uh, transform product because here with this transform product we we are looking at way restaurants things like that hotels. Uh, but storage is another problem because there we we are looking to the local farmers, but often they don't have the the financial capa- capacity to to pay for storage, and they don't understand. They always in a in a short term logic. So as soon as potatoes come out of the ground, they want to sell them. They don't want to store them, even if after some months they can sell them at double price. They don't want to do it because they have a social pressure to sell this product, even if they lose money. So there we, we, we need to find solutions to finance them, to store. Yeah, and finally, I have a few please. minutes left and there was one more question also from uh, in the chat box from Marco Rensema. Rensema, growing problem in Senegal is salinity. What is your possible solution to this issue for small farmers having less than five hectares? There's also another session on salinity, by the way, uh, later on in the program of the Digital Africa Business Days later today. Exactly. So salinity is indeed, it's a, it's a tricky one, you know. So when it comes to salinity, there's uh, the first is how do you cope with increasing salinity? Uh, and So for that, there's definitely a lot more work to be done around saline tolerant seed varieties, for example. Um, There's something to be done around um, making sure that those lands are not left fallow during the during the summer months. And so making sure that there is a a crop that can take you through all the way through those summer months for as much as possible. Uh, And then focusing on that green manuring to make sure that some of the nutrients get returned to the soil and you've got Um, less of that capillary action. Uh, But I don't think that that's a a total solution, you know. Um, There's also something around minimizing irrigation, uh, maybe using drip irrigation um, smartly. Um, And a lot of it is really going to ultimately be about coping with salinity um, more than anything else. Uh, I'm not an expert on it, and I really do recommend that you, you attend that session Um, But it is one of our key recommendations is that this uh, technology and systems and training around salinity is tackled um, with greater depth. All right. Thank you so much. Um, uh, We've we've been able to answer all the uh, remarks and questions and uh, some good questions also for Loda. And thanks for your answers. Thank you very, thank you, Michiel, for a very good explanation in brief on these value chain reports. Uh, it's 11 o'clock, so we have to uh, close this session now. I uh, thank the audience for participating and being present, and we look forward to exchanging more with all of you uh, towards the other uh, events that we're going to organize in March. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.